Hello, beautiful ladies. My name is Amy Hafner, and I'm so excited to be back with you this week because I love beautiful ministry. I love all things girly, but something you may not know about me is that I actually grew up and I was the biggest tomboy. Oh yeah, I did not like to brush my hair, my poor mother, and, and I did not like to wear dresses, and I did not want dolls. I wanted He-Man. And I got made fun of a lot growing up because of my appearance. And, and I, I hate to say it, but it didn't get much better until I went to college. I, I don't know if it was the hair straightener that I got or the hormones, but I remember going to college and people started to look at me differently. And I felt this new confidence that I couldn't explain. I did all the things, and after I graduated from college, I met this tall, dark, and handsome man. He's now my husband, but he wasn't only good looking, but he was kind, he was smart, and he was a really, really good athlete. Actually, he was such a good athlete that he played professional baseball, and he was really good at it, and people loved him. People would cheer for him, and because they loved him so much, well, they naturally liked me. And we got married, and everything was going great, and then the storms began to roll in. And if you don't know what a storm is because you're new to being a Christian, it, it basically just means that problems and trials and stuff started to happen. First, my father-in-law passed away from prostate cancer. Three weeks later, my grandmother, who pretty much spent, I spent a lot of time with growing up, she passed away. And as a 20-year-old girl, it was the first time that I really had to look death in the eye and and it really frightened me. A few months later, my husband, he sustained an injury in his shoulder, and he would never ever recover back to, to before the injury. And the same people that cheered for him, that loved him, began to boo him and curse him. They actually would write letters and send us hate mail wishing that he was dead. And naturally, they didn't like him anymore, so they didn't really care for me. And I remember one night I was scrolling. Some of you have heard the story. I was scrolling. I was reading an article, and I saw my last name in a related article. And, and this was on a website that had 17 million subscribers. And I clicked on it out of curiosity, and the title of this article was MLB's Top 25 Most Tradable Wives. And this article prefaced that the picture of this wife, this wife was so heinous and so ugly that her husband had married so far below what he was worth and he should trade her in for a better model. And I'm sure you could imagine what it felt like when I saw my picture at number 13. And I read the comments, people saying how heinous I was, how ugly I was. One comment actually said, he should throw her out with the trash. <sighs> For three days, I curled up in a ball and I cried and I did not leave the house. I was so embarrassed. I was so mortified. And every time I tell this story, I get a little choked up. And not because that that article was written, but because the girl crying in the corner actually believed it. She actually believed that her worth and her value were based on the words of people. And I could not see myself because I did not yet know our Savior. <laughs> you know, it's just crazy to me, but that God would actually move me and put me in a, in a ministry called Beautiful. He has such a sense of humor, doesn't he? And you know, that is really why the, the main reason that I love this ministry. It's because a woman who follows after God with everything that she has is truly beautiful because the glorious beauty of God shines right through her. And that leads me to my question tonight. And it's kind of a two-part question, but it is, what do you see when you look at me? And that's a good question, you know, to ask about ourselves. God, what do you see when you look at me? God, search my heart. But more importantly, what do you see when you look 
at God? Do you have a skewed view? Is your opinion about God based on what other people have told you? Is your opinion and how you see God based on how you feel that day? Have you, do you have your mind made up about who he is? Do you only check on him when you need something? Do you see him as holy and good? Do you look to the world to tell you what to do, or do you look to his word for the truth? The thing is, every spiritual condition and decision that we make is in direct correlation of our understanding of God's mission and his disposition. And that's in your notes, but I'm going to say it one more time. Every spiritual condition and decision that we make directly correlates on our understanding of God's mission and his disposition. And, and, and this happens, good or bad, to the first king of Israel, King Saul, in our series, Powerful and Present. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be, uh, Saul's life covers 1 Samuel chapter 9 all the way through 2 Samuel, but we're going to stick on two chapters tonight, chapter 10 and chapter 15. But first, let me pray. Father, I just thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you meet us all right where we're at. Father, tonight, let your words be my words. Speak to each woman. You know her heart, Father, and we give this all to you for your name and for your glory. Amen. So if you remember back in, in week one, we were in 1 Samuel and we met a boy and now he's a man. His name is Samuel and he is the only priest, prophet, and judge. And at the time, he is leading Israel through what he hears from God. God is the king, but Samuel is leading. The thing about Samuel is now he is a little bit older and he does not really look like a king or a leader. And the Israelites, they look around and they look at the Amorites and they look at the Philistines and they look at the, these other nations and they see, oh, he's a, a really good looking king over there. And that one over there, he looks like a king. We want to look like all of the other nations. And Samuel reminds them that earthly leadership will take and take and take. Only leadership under God will give and continue to give. But the people pay no mind. So Samuel goes to God and God says, Samuel, don't worry. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me as their king. <laughs> so God appoints a king. He picks someone and his name is Saul. And what, what do we know about Saul? Well, we know that he is the son of Kish. He comes from a noble, wealthy family. We know that he is handsome. We know that he is tall. The Bible says he's a head taller than everyone else. And we know that he is strong. And he's definitely somebody that you would look to from an outward appearance and be like, oh, he looks like a king. The only thing that I noticed when I read this description of him is that there is no mention of the spiritual condition of his heart. The most important quality, they just kind of breeze by. But God is powerful and he is present and here is how he works in 1 Samuel chapter 10. It says, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. When he and his servant arrived at Gilbath, a procession of prophets met, met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him and he joined them in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul among the prophets? And Saul has great success for a few years. He follows God. He remembers God. He, him and Samuel, they, they go on missions. They go on these military battles. But then he has failure after failure after failure. Why? Well, I think we can learn about a lot about failure and a lot about God's character through the life of Saul. So the first thing that Saul, the first thing that where he went wrong was that he forgot. We need to, number one, remember. 400 years before Saul was ever king, 
God wrote a book through Moses called Deuteronomy. And in chapter 17, it actually gives laws and decrees for an earthly king. God knew that the people were going to want an earthly king. So he, he wrote these statues and these decrees. So as soon as the king was anointed, he was supposed to go in front of the priests and the prophets and write his own copy of the scroll. And it says, it is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. Reading the Bible, staying close to God, reading the scroll, it was to keep him from becoming prideful. It was to keep God as the king of his heart and to help him stay on the right path. Now, we, we aren't leading military uh, sieges like Saul was, but we have access to the word of God. You know, I, I think there's a lot of reasons sometimes we don't read it, time, we don't understand it. But I also think it's because sometimes what we read in it, well, it's not exactly what we want to do. How about this? Forgive your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Forgive as Jesus has forgiven you. This is really hard to do. What about if someone abuses you and mistreats you and uses you? How do you forgive that? Huh. Well, let me just say this. Forgiveness does not mean restoration uh, of the relationship. If, if you have been in a situation like that, it doesn't mean you forgive and go back into the same patterns. But forgiveness isn't just for the other person. It is for us. It's saying, God, I am going to remember what you did for me on the cross. I am not going to take the grace that you have given me for granted. When we forgive, people see Christ in us. But what about when we mess up, when we need forgiveness? Saul messed up and he needed to repent. That's number two. Now, nobody really likes this word. Repenting is hard because we're actually admitting that we're wrong and we're actually admitting that we need to turn and go the other way. It's, it's humbling. It's hard. But I also think we have a hard time repenting and then accepting forgiveness because we are perfectionists. And this is the most prideful thing, in my opinion, that we can do because it is saying that, God, okay, I know you died for all of these sins, but my sin where I am what you did wasn't enough. When we mess up, the enemy will beat you up and you will stay stuck. I was so there this week and I found myself on my knees, flat on my face, crying out to God, God, please give me a new heart. And he reminded me of this verse in Romans 12 too. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. When we have our minds renewed, we are able to reject what is not from him. So we remember we repent, we get renewed, and we have to reject, but there is one more thing. We have to take responsibility. Saul's downfall was that he never truly repented with his whole, whole heart, and he never truly took responsibility for his actions. He's actually caught in a lie by Samuel. He tells Samuel, yeah, I did exactly what the Lord told me to do, and, and Samuel calls him out in chapter 15. And then as soon as Samuel calls him out, this is what he says. He says, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandments of the Lord and your words, Samuel's words, because I feared people and I listened to their voice. We take responsibility by having accountability. You know, Anytime I prepare a message or, or have to make a decision, I don't do it by myself. The first thing I do is I go to God and I pray and I ask God for help. 
but I also have people that, that I run things by, that I ask questions to, hey, am I in, on the right track? I have given them permission to speak truth into my life with love and kindness. That is one of the reasons that I love groups so much, why I love beautiful so much. I have met some of my best people that have helped me walk out this Christian life because this life can be hard and we need accountability. But King Saul, he forgets who God is. He does not remember. He does not repent with his whole heart. And he does not take responsibility for his action. So God comes to a point and he has had enough. So he decides to anoint and appoint a new king. And as he sends Samuel out, he reminds him, people judge by outward appearances, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, King David is a great king. He's really, really good, but he still messes up. He still fails. And as we read the story of the kings of Israel and of Judah throughout the history of time, we, we see these failures because the, the thing is that no earthly king can ever be the king of kings. All of it, all of the failure, all of the mess was always pointing back to the redemption that we find in Jesus because he is powerful and through his Holy Spirit, he is present today. God does not need us to be perfect because he is perfect. He just wants us to follow after him with everything that we have, even when we don't understand, even when it's tough, even when it feels like he is dragging us. Father God, I just pray over the women listening. God, help us to see the invisible. Help us to see you. Help us to seek you in everything that we do. Father, give us a new heart. Renew our mind and help us to seek you every day of our lives. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.